Uh, so birthday hunting, we're going to be looking at applying some of the um, ideas behind the maths of the birthday paradox to some work that goes on around the CERT. Uh, so just for um, anyone maybe unfamiliar with CERT work or the birthday paradox, um, we're going to go through a little bit of that before moving into uh, how it all fits together. Uh, so me, I'm a security data scientist, worked with a number of CERTs over the years um, and had a formal background in physics and risk before that. So, uh, so one of the problems with the CERT that can happen over time is this sort of tunnel vision. So a few signatures tend to dominate all the attention from you know, IDS, DLP, uh, phishing reports, that sort of thing. And so then in a way like this map that you're looking at of what's happening in your network uh, becomes the terrain. And so this is what everyone's skills uh, become. We're very good at closing phishing tickets, you know, very good at like closing DLP tickets. Uh, and so then when something serious happens under duress, this is the sort of skills we're falling back on. And maybe it's not so common that these incidents are the ones that cause the, you know, the big crises in the SOC. Um, so one of the other problems is um, evaluating these machine learning products. So there's a lot of them out there. Um, they all do some very fantastic stuff. Uh, but for, on the ground for the analysts, uh, often it's very much just you'll get a list, uh, you'll have a look at it, you say, oh, this looks pretty good, maybe this looks a bit funny, um, maybe there's some false positives in there, uh, and then you have to make a decision on it. Uh, so the birthday paradox itself, uh, so in the classical presentation, um, how many people in a room before you have like 50% likelihood of two sharing a birthday? So if you have about you know, 23 people, it's on 50%. If you go up to like 40, suddenly it's like 80%. Um, and so you can represent it. Um, it's much easier with the math to consider just the likelihood of two pairs happening. And so you have two people combinatorial um, over n, and so then there's you know 365 days, and so what are the odds that they're not one of those 365? Take that away from one, and now you have the probability that you can work out per person in the room. Uh, so to get just to get it more intuitively, um, the, how this works is there's only 365 days rather than the one in 365 that you do in your head, and so. If you think about that in terms of like a solid grid with about 300 squares in it, you're trying to throw, say, 20 stones at it. As you get to, say, the nth stone over here, um, the likelihood that it's not going to hit into anything else, it starts to run out of space pretty quickly. And so you can imagine that as this number gets higher, very quickly you run out of spaces for it to land. So. Uh, threat hunting, and so just for the purposes of the talk, uh, this cert, so cert goes in, investigates indicators, um, and so the two main ways for this to happen is through matching, which is you know your signatures, your IDS, your um, like DLP, that sort of thing, and then hunting, which is more hypothesis based, like I think this bad thing is out there, maybe uh, intel driven a little bit, um, that sort of stuff. And so then both of those feed into the same sort of process. So we roll over to containment. You know, we park the van out front. We go have a look at the pixies down the bottom of the garden, see what's going on, uh, circle around. And then that follows into the usual remediation steps, you know, call HR, legal, uh, in network infrastructure teams, that sort of thing. So in practice, what often ends up happening is um, the cycles become very front heavy. So whether this is like feed or um, like incident response cycle, you do a lot of identification and then a lot of just closing tickets. So particularly as discussed around the phishing, the DLP and the malware, um, these become very heavy focused and suddenly our DFR process becomes a lot closer to just pulling from the network and re-imaging than the process that you might need for a big serious incident. So the question then becomes, how do you sort of unbias this in um, a nice structured way so everyone gets a good experience about what's going on for maybe more critical incidents that are gonna damage the SOC or the, the company? So, so for the math thing, the first thing we're gonna do is just generalize this uh, birthday paradox. So we started with uh, 365 days. Um, we can do some Taylor expansion and some tricky triangle number maths, and we can end up with um, a much more general form, so this one. And so here, we, if we can say 
okay, we have n checks of you know something going on for each of our assets, and we have m assets, then the probabilities of finding something interesting uh, comes out something like this. So um, you can approximate it a little bit further um, if you just want to do another Taylor expansion on that uh, exponential, but um, as is is you know easy enough to put into a spreadsheet. Yeah. So what this looks like from the adversary's perspective, um, one, there isn't a time dimension to this equation, so it all sort of happens at once. And so in cert time, this is uh, roughly the dwell time you can make an argument for. So at say 90 days, you can certainly look through um, a lot of assets for you know WMIA um, services, uh, scheduled tasks, that sort of thing, you know, the greatest hits. Um, to find something interesting. And so you're doing all this over a 90-day period. You can certainly get a high number in there. Um, where can the adversary possibly you know, compromise that isn't going to be looked at in that sort of time period? And the same way as we had with the birthdays, you're running out of space. Now in your network, uh, the adversary is running out of space as well. Uh, so in terms of like actual numbers on the board, um, we can have a look at the couple of interesting things here is that for, for 1K assets, which is you know, maybe a pretty small organization, um, it really doesn't it take much to get that up to a pretty reasonable likelihood of finding something interesting. The other interesting one is for 100K assets, maybe you're a very large organization now, um, to find, say, 500 hours over uh, all your staff in, say, a 90-day period, it doesn't strike me as that challenging, um, especially for something where if you want to like hone it down to just the critical stuff, it seems pretty reasonable. So the other thing that's interesting here is that this is only talking about um, a single compromised host. So uh, I don't know about your organizations, um, or sorry, I'm not speaking for mine, but it seems like the likelihood of uh, a single compromised host out of, say, 100,000 assets is maybe unlikely again. Uh, in that case, those count as um, an extra hunt, if you like. So that's one that you can find that as well is um, going back to our sort of one of these guys. Sure. Um, so as for like how valuable this is to the organization, um, the first one is working out, say, an acceptable likelihood. So uh, this won't work every time. You know, there's a statistical element to it. So what's acceptable for you and for the organization? So you're putting people on this. Maybe you don't necessarily need your super forensicators, but just the regular people, maybe some um, guided learning going on can get a pretty reasonable crack at it. Um, the other thing is this um, does a lot better at looking for existential risks, so it's not hard to imagine some kind of incident, regardless of how unlikely, but it could certainly happen that that's the end of the company, so maybe um, all your investors leave, maybe uh, all your computers get wiped, maybe your Maersk and your domain controllers are gone. Um, and so these sort of things can happen, but they're also not that likely to be like IDS straight away or like malware or um, like phishing. Maybe they'll start that way, but uh, something that's maybe been lurking there for a little while is um, much more susceptible to being found through this sort of approach. Um, the other nice things about this is um, much like some of the cyber you know, products out there, this one's self-learning, it's agentless, there's no end of life, it's all just driven by your people, and so the sort of thing that's you know, relatively easy to implement, maybe it's just setting a calendar thing in Outlook and you're good to go. You also get, um, it's a very low pressure environment, so you know, we know something out there has happened, but that's always true for um, sort of cert work anyway. So to have people on that um, is like a good experience, so you get out there in the network, you're pulling logs, you're seeing what's really going on in your network, rather than uh, viewing it through the lens of um, maybe your seam or your IDS. Uh, so there's a couple of tricks you can do to sh shrink the um, number of assets you want to worry about. So um, you can show through like a two-player game of you know good guy, bad guy, uh, two strategies of like hack something, don't hack something, and then um, investigate 
something like the alert going on, don't investigate the alert going on. Um, you can show that the likelihood of you know, the bad guy doing something is kind of proportional to the value of it, so your high value assets, which intuitively makes sense and it's nice that we have the maths to back it up. But what that means for your approach here is that maybe you don't need to go and look at um, your cat picture server, you can probably leave that one alone, while maybe the exchange server is higher up on the list. Um, there's a couple of great uh, like log reduction tools to pull out the interesting stuff, um, and so maybe the stuff that doesn't have anything interesting on, you don't necessarily want to worry about. So uh, David J. Bianco's ClearCut um, is pretty good. It's on uh, GitHub. Um, you can also knock together a couple of Python scripts looking at things like Markov chain transitions for the log lines. You can sort of summarize the entropy. You can look for just like small anomalies on those, just simple thresholding, that sort of thing. Uh, another good one is uh, shadow IT. So if through this process you start to find, oh, I don't know what this M is, I don't know what this asset is, I don't know what this asset is, um, maybe it's a good one to handball to your network or your endpoint team to um, just get them taken off or you know, shifted to the proper channels and make it somebody else's problem. Um, so some things you can also do to get the number of like investigations you can do up. So we're talking about investigations. Um, there's a lot of great guidance around for like you know infosec uh, education. So you know there's some cheat sheets that walk you through it. There's some great books around uh, like sort of malware analysis, uh, network analysis, that sort of thing. Um, you can cut down, so you don't necessarily have to look for just everything, everything. Um, things like um, lateral movement, things like persistence, um, privilege escalation, those sorts of things have a lot of like forensic revenue uh, residue that sticks around and so make a good target for this sort of thing. And then they can be cut down further to you know just the hits like WMI stuff, maybe a um, bit of services, uh, scheduled tasks. Um, another one is uh, getting compromised more is like you know, a reasonable strategy. It's certainly going to work. Um, each additional like server with something suspicious going on means that if you're just looking for one, the maths doesn't care about that one anymore, and so you can sort of exclude it from your pile. Uh, and so then some interesting stuff happens if you get to the end of this process and you haven't necessarily found anything. So there's a few ways to look at that. One of those is uh, maybe you were just unlucky, and you know that happens. But if it's happening consistently, there's some stuff you can infer from that. So, um, well, one, maybe you're not compromised at all. You have a beautiful, secure network, uh, which is feasible. For, um, the maths could be wrong, uh, which you know, is probably unlikely. But then there's other ones around um, maybe the hypotheses that you're generating for your hunting and the places that you're looking. Um, if there's a significant difference between where that should be and what's just happened randomly through this process, uh, maybe that's a good signal to review those processes and have a look at what's going on there. Uh, so that's one way to apply this idea to it. So what we have now is this like baseline of how often you should expect to find something if you're just going out there and sort of pulling, you know, pulling the memory images, get the like cool forensic stuff out of it, having squeezed through that. So you can also use this to now evaluate the big expensive uh, security products you've bought. So often, for the purposes of the talk anyway, we'll say um, it's a black box. You don't necessarily know what's going inside. They won't necessarily tell you. Um, and it'll give you just a list of these are the suspicious assets you should have a look at. Uh, the other property of these is they're usually capital E expensive. So the marketing for these is wild often. You know, you've got some mythical bird god. It's going to swoop in, find your stuff. So the, one of the core problems here is that only if the POC is successful is the company going to make a sale. Uh, and so that's fine for the company. But for you, what, because we know there's like a high likelihood of just finding something anyway, and this company certainly isn't selling just to your company. They're selling to everybody at once. And so that means that while you may or may not find something, they're certainly going to make their revenue just potentially of, of luck, depending on you know, how many things it can put out and how great the marketing is. Uh, and so this random number generator might end up being cheaper anyway than you implementing some kind of random process where you go out and have a look at it. 
maybe you want to offload that. And so maybe you know, it's worth it from that sense. But um, this is the sort of baseline you want to be comparing it to rather than something like, oh, we found something you know, very interesting in our logs and this is why we should buy the product. So if you take this idea of we're going to validate these answers that come out of it more so than um, spending a lot of time figuring out the exact inner workings of it, it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, unlike what a lot of the how to buy machine learning product guides will tell you of figure out how they're training it, figure out the sort of models that they're using, figure out you know, how often they're retraining it. Like it, for this sort of process, uh, it doesn't matter so much if they're doing some kind of me mechanical Turk thing where they just pipe the um, numbers off to Amazon and have someone else have a look at it. Um, what you're really interested in is what stuff are they telling us and how much better are they doing than just a simple random number generator? And then is this cheaper than I could implement a random number generator myself? Uh, so yeah, you can, um, so from the equations from before, you can just calculate those. There's um, not too much. You can do it in a spreadsheet. Um, and maybe even simplify that again if you're spooked by having an exponential in there. So, so coming up. Um, the precision that we're looking for here, it's not so much, the idea is it's not one in like however many assets you have, it's just one in the assets that you have. Uh, there's not any more than that, there's certainly not any less than that. And so if you catalog these and have a good understanding of your assets, while you know, it's a boring answer that you get from every security talk, it's also a great foundation to build up this like more uh, sophisticated ML sort of thing. Uh, and so the other th nice thing here is if you know how many you should be expecting to find in there, um, or at least a portion of that from the red team, you can use that as the baseline. And so now you have an M, you can solve, you know how many you went and had a look for. And so the percentage that comes out, you're solving it the other way around. And now you're looking at um, a measure of success for how good your uh, sort of, not necessarily threat hunting team, but regular analyst type, let's go, we found something have a look at it, work is. So, um, well, so what this also gets from us is just looking at the logs rather than depending on just whatever comes out of the seam at the time, you get a nice structured way of analyzing that. Uh, and so, so it's a nice drill, it's a detection method in itself because the things that you find aren't going to be part of your regular, maybe you've mapped to MITRE's attack framework and these are the 30% you know, likelihood of finding, these are well covered. This um, potentially gives you much broader coverage of that for not too much, or not any really, infrastructure investment. Um, it's also, uh, maybe you get to say you're doing chaos engineering on the back of it. There's some probability here. You're working through the whole process and finding out the, um, the long-tailed stuff that happens when the uh, incident goes down. Uh, so yeah, probably the last one is that uh, even like a broken machine learning product is right 22% of the day. Um, so the POCs, um, they're not ergodic, so if you do 100 POCs is different to the company selling to 100 people. Um, and so there's not necessarily just pull out the good stuff and have a look at it. You want to really compare it to this baseline. Uh, so thanks. All right, do we have any questions? So I know this was like a half hour talk and so it went really quick. Um, would it be possible for you to put on, like do a Jupyter notebook laying out, here's an example of, you know, testing a RNG against, you know, some just basic classifier, you know, a linear regression or something, yep. just so that we can see kind of the work through? Uh, Not against even any real data, just against like just a simulation so that we could see how the calculations would occur. Uh, sure. So I, you could, it's really around um, you have your thing that'll give you a certain, it looked at 100,000 assets, it came back with 10, 20, 100, whatever. Um, and then you would just send maybe like a level two analyst um, on the Friday, grab, a, grab an hour, go look for persistence in you know, as many VMs as you can get to, that sort of thing. 
And so then, because you know how many assets you have, you know how many they looked at, if those numbers are the same um, just compared to this, uh, then that's the measure of the thing. So it makes sense, but for the... It makes sense, but for the purposes of remembering this after I go drinking tonight, yeah, um, gotcha. it would be very helpful to have it like laid out in like a little notebook or something. Yeah, sure. Thanks. You've got one in the back. I think you shot. Yeah, that's right. So the one of the underlying assumptions for the birthday paradox is yep. that you basically have uniform birthdays, right? Because yep. everybody has, ro or there's like yeah, a roughly yeah, equal probability. That doesn't strike me as the case here. Yeah, so address that a little bit um, back in the N stuff. Yeah, so um, you can assume like uh, the key thing is like at least one asset is compromised. So from this assumed breach, um, if you really believe that this is a good, okay, well you better, um, which you know may or may not be true. So that's fair. Uh, the idea here, though, is that it doesn't um, necessarily matter if it's um, equal or not. It's just a question of more or less. And so there's some minimum amount. They're more likely to be in high value assets. And so that's going to fluctuate around absolutely, but to a first order sort of approximation. Um, maybe you can do some stuff like this, um, but you really um, not really um, have anything to say something would be more or li less likely to be compromised. So over you know 10,000 uh, assets, it's probably going to average out. Any other questions? Any other questions? All right. Um, thanks again. Then. Thanks. thanks.